All right then, we, we lost ours at home yesterday, so okay. Just us kids. <laughs> Let me invite you to stand as you are able. Blessed be the one holy and living God. Together, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A reading. A reading. Just. A reading <laughs> from the first book of Moses, commonly called Genesis. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him inside and said, Look towards the heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these things and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. 
As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down, it was dark. A smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me, Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God who created us, who redeems us, and who will lead us home. Amen. Amen.
Clear your desks. This is a pop quiz. Everybody ready? When the Roman legions march into your territory to invade, conquer, and occupy your land, what is your first sign that they are just over the next hill? Even if you didn't read the book but only saw the movie, you should get this one. The answer? Banners. The banners. At the head of every legion, there was somebody carrying a banner. And on top of the banner indicating which legion it was, there was always the figure of an eagle with outstretched wings. Can you picture that? Can you imagine those? The first things that you see coming over the hill as the army approaches. Actually, the first thing you can see is the dust cloud that goes back like a mile. Uh, but, but what you see are these eagles rising over the ridges. The Roman eagle was a sign of many things. Fierce power, but also faithfulness. Eagles mate for life when they can, returning to the same nest when they can. Uh, Jan and I have been going to Assateague, uh, uh, the wildlife refuge there uh, near Shinkateague, for years and years and years. There's been the same pair of eagles in the same nest for seven years now. We, we even get to know some of the people who show up the same time that we do to watch them. I mean, that's the kind of faithfulness that eagles represent. They're equally adept at attacking the enemy, foraging for their food, and defending those who are at home. It's a very powerful symbol. and Everybody got it. <laughs> so, when Jesus gets around to describing the eagerness of God to, to gather, defend, and protect God's beloved children, what does he choose? A chicken. A hen. You're not laughing. <laughs> You need to be laughing at this. This is gold. This is comedy gold. In the midst of controversy, in the midst of personal danger, Jesus keeps his sense of humor. Chickens are only mentioned once in the New Testament. You just heard it. They're only mentioned once in the Old Testament, and that's in a long list of food that was required by Solomon's court to feed his courtiers every week. It is the paucity of mentions of poultry that makes Jesus' line so funny. And it gives rise to all sorts of, of sort of creative memes that follow. Roman eagles versus Jewish chickens. Insert your favorite soup recipe here. Now, Herod is described by Jesus as a fox. Foxes and hens. Take that set of memes over to another place and play with those for a while. There's some good jokes there. By the way, Fox went out on a chilly night. That American folk tune, not interested in chickens, ducks and geese. Just, just to, we know that we're talking about a different thing here. So the humor that Jesus displays is not necessarily sermon worthy, except as it connects to the way God has chosen to relate to human beings from the very beginning. We were created in the image of God, male and female. And God walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the garden, not as creator and creatures, but as friends and neighbors. And we all know the story of what happened and the subsequent alienation between God and human beings that unfolds, culminating in the end of chapter 11 of Genesis, the Tower of Babel story, where, where God just says, enough of this, and scatters everybody physically and linguistically. Then there's a long breather, and God decides that it is time to redeem the mess that we had created. This is not God's fault that we ended up alienated. This is our own fault. We chose this, and often continue to choose this. And so God says, how are we going to restore these relationships that were so important that have now so thoroughly broken down? And it turns out uh, we human beings are a really tough nut to crack. Genesis chapter 12. God chooses Abraham and speaks to him from heaven. It's a voice only. The voice comes to him while he is in Haran in the Chaldean lands. And he says, Abram, leave everything. 
Go to this place I'm going to show you. We're going to start a new nation. You're going to be the head of a great family. And Abraham does. And after a while, it is clear that nothing is happening. Okay. What's next? Well, God appears to Abram in a vision, a little bit more substantively. At the end of the story we read today, God is apparently present in that fire pot, passing through the dead animals that representing, represent the cutting of the covenant that God has now made. It's a little bit more than just a voice from heaven. It's in a dream. Ab Abram is clearly exhausted. But it's more than it was before. God is reaching more intimately into human lives than before. And what happens? Well, not much, actually. So we go a third round. And in the third round, God appears in a fleshly form, the form of three visitors, three angels. Angels equals messengers. Face to face, Abram is with these three angels. They have, they have a mission. They're going to go do that mission too. But finally, there is face to face contact between Abram and the angel, singular, represented by these three angelic beings, the angel of the Lord. And it is a year after that that the promise begins to be fulfilled. Because in the next year, when they return, Sarah has the child she had been praying for all of her life. Now, it is not too much of a stretch to say that the rest of Hebrew scriptures represent the increasingly personal and intimate efforts of God to reach out to human beings. Ultimately, to encourage repentance and to offer to save them. And the illustrations, one after the other, just line up ahead of us. Moses in the Exodus to save the people from slavery. The judges to help organize the people into a community based on God as their king. That doesn't work. The kings and then the prophets who have to accuse the kings and the sages who record holy wisdom. It's all part of this same pattern of God reaching out. You get the best relationship between God and human being in Jeremiah, I think. It's, it's a painful one to watch, but it's a personal, it's, it's, a, it's a, a deep, um, uh, it is a, um, an intense relationship that the two of them have with each other. And, and it worked some of the time. God reaching out into human lives in this way. It worked some of the time. But in the end, God understood that that alone was not enough. And I have this vision. I've had it, you know, off and on for years. Uh, of the heavenly throne room where God the creator, the word, the holy anointed one, and the Holy Spirit are communing with each other just by being together. And one day God asks, okay, still isn't getting done what I need to get done. Which one of you wants to go? And I picture both the Word and the Spirit like shooting up their hands. I don't know, or whatever they got. And God points to the Word, to the Messiah, to the Anointed One, says, you first, and then to the Holy Spirit, you second. You follow up. When this one's done, you go next. The theological term for this whole process is incarnation. We're used to talking about incarnation at Christmas time. Incarnation starts way before Mary and Jesus. Incarnation starts at the point at which God tries to reach out to us in human ways so that we can have that kind of personal and intimate relationship, uh, relations with God. And the fact that God has been reaching out to us in a continuingly intimate and accessible way for a very long time is the point. And Jesus is the epitome of that point. Not the only part of it. Not the only part of it. Which means, by the way, that, that incarnation continues for us as we see the saving power of God in each other. As we see the forgiving willingness of God in each other. 
as we see the ability to use my hands and your brains and somebody else's vision to come together in ministry, that's incarnation still. And Jesus is just that one piece of it that starts when God reached out to Abram before he was even Abraham. And look at the state of the incarnation when it is in Jesus' hands. He's a real guy. He's a real guy like one of us. As a matter of fact, I'd, I'd love to just sort of hang with him. Not, not to see miracles, but because some of this stuff is just right funny. Just right pleasant to be part of. He makes fun of Roman eagles in the face of their legions. They're all over Jerusalem. They're all over Palestine. He's making fun of them. He calls his chief antagonist, King Herod, a fox. Instead of running away to safety, like even the Pharisees think he should do, he's making fun of this guy who wants him dead. That's how real Jesus is. He knows that he's on his way to Jerusalem, a trip that, by the way, takes 10 chapters in Luke's Gospel. We get most of it in August and September. He's on his way to Jerusalem, and he knows he will be arrested and tried and executed. And he knows that God will take this sacrifice and use it to make things right between the creator and the created order, for those of us who are created. Jesus probably even understands how this will work, first in the resurrection itself, and finally in his ascension, and then back to the throne of God, where he will tag team up with the Holy Spirit to take it from there. That's how God is working in the world. With a sense of humor, with deep passion, with deep intimacy. That's the kind of God we have, a God that loves that existence. Not some God who's sitting on a throne waiting for you to beat yourself up because of your sins. That's not what Lent is all about. Lent is about understanding who is God in this world. How have we known God in the past? How will we know God now? How can we orient our lives to what God wants us to do? That's what Lent is all about. A time when we try to connect more clearly, to be part of God's mission more substantively. And knowing how consistent God has been back over the long past at reaching out to human beings should motivate us and inspire us to reach back. Truth is, the track record for our species is not always great. And that's why we need to attend to it every year and every Lent to be sure to keep at it because God can do great things for us now just as God did for Abraham, for Jesus, and for the disciples in the past. Look for the signs of that God around you. Not some harsh judge, but one who wants to walk with you And remember that having a sense of humor helps. Amen. Please stand as you are able and join me in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and God's kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people, form one. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. For our Michael, our presiding bishop, for Eugene, our bishop, for Robert, our assisting bishop, and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. For our Joseph, our president, for Larry, our governor, for Barry, our county executive, for Kevin, the mayor of Bel Air, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. For Hartford County, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for seasonable weather, and for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for an end to war, violence, and hostility in Ukraine and in other conflict-torn countries, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. that we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. In the communion of the Blessed Virgin Mary, James Theodore Holly, and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. God, to whom our needs are known before we ask. Help us to ask only what accords with your will, and those good things which we dare not, or in our blindness cannot ask, grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor. Oh, sorry. And we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us 
that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile Earth, our island home. 
from the primal elements who brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. Holy, holy. Your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So, Father, we who have been redeemed by him, and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by the Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of our mothers, Sarah, Miriam, and Hannah, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only, and not for strength, for pardon only, and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. The gifts of God for the people of God Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Uh, let me ask your indulgence, and, and if you come forward to communion, please come all the way up to the uh, altar rail today. Thank you. body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven.
Let us pray. Holy God, the reality of your saving presence in this bread and wine is an outward and visible sign of the providence by which you sustain our lives and the world we live in. Grant that the spirit of this sacrament may empower us to be faithful witnesses to the wonder of your creation, the love you have shown in redemption, and the praises that ring out from our heavenly home. Amen. Keep this your family, Lord, with your never-failing mercy, that relying solely on the help of your heavenly grace, they may be upheld by your divine protection. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.